Il y en a qui se sont Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of South Africa, Comrade Jacob Zuma and Madame. Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Zimbabwe, Comrade Robert Gabriel Mugabe, and Amai. My colleague, Honorable Minister, Rob Davis, not Smith. <laughs> Honorable ministers from South Africa and Zimbabwe, the business delegations from the two countries, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends. Before I do what I'm supposed to do here, let me just, Your Excellencies, advise you that um, we do have a business delegation from Zimbabwe and a business delegation from South Africa. But we also have a new organization that represents Zimbabweans doing business in South Africa. They are also here and they are also going to be participating. I'm sure they will also be there to make a big contribution to Zimasset. I'd also want to advise you that we have had similar fora before, but this one has been the best in terms of attendance. I think it's a, it's a huge, it's an indication of the huge appetite for investment back home and also the warm bilateral trade relations between our two countries. But I think most importantly, it's because of your presence, your excellencies. Can we give them another round of applause? <laughs> Today I have the, the honor and privilege to introduce a very special guest to the Zimbabwe South Africa Business Forum who is none other than His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Zimbabwe, Comrade Robert Gabriel Mugabe. Born on the 21st of February, 1924, at Kutama Mission, His Excellency, Comrade Mugabe, played a leading role together with other nationalists, notably the late Father Zimbabwe, Dr. Joshua Nkomo in the liberation struggle that culminated in the emancipation of the people of Zimbabwe from the colonial yoke of Britain in 1980. Under His Excellency, Comrade Mugabe's visionary leadership, government has pursued mutually beneficial friendship and strategic alliances with the neighboring and regional countries. Indeed, Zimbabwe has been able to broaden their economic horizons and extend their frontiers of trade and investment by embarking on various joint cooperation projects with South Africa. Comrade Mugabe is currently the chairman of both Southern African Development Co Community, SADC, and the African Union, AU. He has actively championed the goals of the SADC and the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa commerce as the regional blocks move towards greater integration. He has also, he has also been leading the tripartite negotiations under the African Union with a view of coming up with a single continental free trade area. He has been very vocal on issues of value addition as well as industrialization, encompassing regional value chains. His Excellency the President holds several degrees, 
And he has also been awarded a total of 12 honorary degrees. Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, today we are honored to have this great revolutionary amongst us. It is therefore my singular honor and privilege to call His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Zimbabwe, Comrade Robert Gabriel Mugabe, to talk to the Zimbabwe South Africa Business Forum. Your Excellency, sir. Your Excellency, Comrade President Jacob Zuma and Madam, Honorable Ministers here present, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends. South Africa and Zimbabwe. Very excellent relations. Relations historical. Relations geographical relations territorial, relations even marital. <laughs> we, we still all cows, of course. <laughs> and relations economically. President Zuma spoke of the need for us now to work for poor people. He spent many years Robin Island, many years abroad, we interacted. as representative of the ANC, Mkondo Sisu, back home. Delivered under the leadership of Madiba. a new dispensation. It was a political dispensation. My minister, Comrade Bima, spoke of our Zimbabwe endeavor to free ourselves. A number of leaders now gone. <coughs> Comrade Joshua Nkomo, we call him father of Zimbabwe. Mzenda Msika, JZ, and on both sides, yes, the political leadership. the fighters now. Mkontwe Sizwe, Zebra, 
Zanla on the other side. And the strength and the force of those was always the, the people. The people in South Africa supporting Mkondo is Israel. The people in Zimbabwe supporting supporting the Chimrega. The people. We delivered the wish of the people 1980 as independence came. The wish of the people was delivered here with a new political dispensation 1994. What President Zuma was emphasizing was that we delivered political independence. We did not deliver economic independence. And that was the story throughout Africa. People were politically free. No apartheid, no racism, yes. You couldn't be arrested for nothing. <laughs> we were being arrested for nothing. Robin Island, full of people arrested for crime, for committing no crime. Back home, we have hundreds being bombed, thousands actually, in various camps. Zambia, Mozambique, innocent people, refugees, some young, some old. They were not all military fighters, no. Just refugees, killed for no crime. So we delivered political independence. You are surprised, I'm sure. We did not control the economy. We couldn't deliver the freedom. You had no power. You were not owners of your natural resources. Others, the very people we fought against, remained in control of our economies throughout Africa. That's the story. And that is why there is no industrialization anywhere in Africa except what was done here, South Africa. But that industrialization was done in the interests mainly of the whites. All our minds controlled not even by locals, local whites, by outside. You talk, you talk to a standard. You, you, you didn't know who standard was, who is stand, the owner of Standard Bank. I don't know, I can't tell you. <laughs> But I know the country. <laughs> I, didn't, I don't know who Barclays was <laughs> or is, but I know the mother country. <laughs> they control us to this day. We haven't delivered. Not even, yes, we took the step because we had negotiated it at independence at Lancaster House. The land, that the land should come. The land should come into our hands. And Margaret Thatcher had agreed that there should be that land reform. And we embarked on it in accordance with the Constitution. We took it from... Ian Smith, 
and company. Rhodes was n now long dead. <laughs> long live dead Rhodes. Others still fear that, oh, we have the grave. <laughs> we can't say you merely have a, a, a statue. <laughs> <laughs> we'll fear that uh, he would rise. <laughs> if people don't rise from statues, they rise. They rise from graves. And and our young ones have all insisted that we remove the grave. But you can't, if you remove the bones, surely the hole where he, he would have laid will remain. And I don't know whether the, his spirit, when the bones, it's only bones we will be removing now. But the spirit is gone or it's somewhere afloat in our country. <laughs> anyway, these are the people who laid us and uh, here, naturally, he did also lots of, of harm to your diamonds. By hook or by crook, he was always the winner over all the other competitors in Kimberley. No one could beat Rhodes. Cheating at night, removing, you know, the pigs. And so, it's there in writing. He was doing that to enlarge his, his claims, the area of his claims, and fighting over it with others, discovering the, the pigs had been moved to narrow their own, you know, claim areas and widen his own. And who could defeat him? He had all the support and so on. When he died, he had that, you know, a relief of seven million. Not, not to us, not to the Africans of, even of, uh, of South Africa, where, where he had got his wealth from. But now, to benefit people of the world, students, they can come from Nigeria, from any other white countries to go to Oxford, but not blacks, not blacks. The black man is on his own. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. And our Zim Acid recognizes that the agenda shall be an, a sustained agenda of adding value. But alas, add value to what? You don't add value to somebody else's natural resources. We must own the natural resources first. Make them our own. Hence, indigenization and empowerment. You indigenize. Take and make. <laughs> and when you produce now, you are producing from your own natural resource. 
And we have said, of course, in our case, it's much simpler than in your case. <laughs> yes. But, uh, but uh, the more intricate the system, the greater the fight required. And when it's a people's fight, you can never lose. You may suffer losses along the way, but it's a moral fight. The goal will be victory. Victory for the people. So in our case, natural resources, the mines, the land we have taken, agriculture, There are white farmers, we are still there, but no longer as owners of the land, all the land belongs to the state. They will farm on the land as they are doing and produce now. As people, some of them have the, the citizenship, produce for the state and not to just produce for the little clique of 250,000 whites, who they, which is the number they wear at most. So there has to be at the base of beneficiation, ownership by the people, hence indigenization and, and empowerment are a fire, a very vital tool. And this is what we would want you to consider. And consider very seriously, I want to thank the business communities, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and even the, the 50 who represent those Zimbabweans doing business in South Africa. At this one, we are all one. President Zuma is celebrating soon his 73rd birthday. I've celebrated my 91st. <laughs> and here we are combining our forces, a hundred and sixty-four years. <laughs> the weight of that on the decisions you're going to take cannot be overhauled by anyone in the future, can it? <laughs> so we promise you, if your decisions, as long as they are in accordance with the principles for which we have fought, will have the weight, current weight, of 164 tons. <laughs> we are not taking now the weight of those who fought with us who are no longer with us. But we represent them, the two of us. I don't know whether you would allow us to represent the future. We say no. The future generations, they will have to look at us and say, ah, did we give them the correct basis, foundation, on which they can stand as they move into the future?
So we are happy to be with you. And it gives me the great pleasure to address all of you gathered here today under the banner of the Zimbabwe South Africa Business Forum. A forum which I hope will not only be for this occasion as an important part of my state visit here, but will become a regular mechanism for structured interactions between our business communities, including our public sector representatives. We are hoping we can use it also as a springboard for getting our African territory to do the same. We tell you, independence is only a half measure in most of our African countries. Some don't even control a bit of their natural resources. Go to Gabon. All wealth that lies underground belongs to France. It's, that's the, the agreement. And it is so in other Francophone countries. Oil, they discover oil, it belongs to France. They discover diamonds, they belong to France. And the miners will be naturally French. And what apportionment you are given, perhaps 12% of the earnings from oil, 15%, it's, it's terrible. Equatorial Guinea has come out of it. And they describe to us what is happening to their neighbors. And that's why one coup after another, coup attempt after another, you see, uh, is tried. But unfortunately, unfortunately for them, they, they, they have had the wisdom to know in advance that the Spanish, the French, and so on, are arranging these coups, coup d'etat. But uh, the issue is to put them, to, just to remove the leadership, so the West can control. You saw what happened when they can't, can't remove a person have a person removed by his government, by his people, they contrive some, uh, put together some concoction of lies. He is oppressing, he's oppressing his own people, he's killing his own people, that Daffy. We must prevent him from killing his own people. Go to the United Nations and have the proof of crying Libyans, oh, this man is killing us. And you believe the tears? No. They are induced. <laughs> False tears. To get... They have been brought over to get the world to believe that true, this man is oppressing his own people. And NATO is given the go-ahead by the Security Council. They get the two thirds majority. And their aim, first objective is to hunt for the leader, Gaddafi, even for his children, and try to kill them. And they succeeded. 
killed members of his family. He tried to hide, but they caught up with him and pretended that uh, it was one of his one of his own people who shot him. The same story had been told about Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And there the lie was that he had weapons of mass destruction. Poor Saddam Hussein. They have the bombs of mass destruction. And they come to uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq and say, oh, he has guns, he, terrible ones, of, which kill people massively. He tried to say no, no. Bush went to the United Nations. The United Nations said, no, you can't attack. Then he said, ah, oh, well, we'll go. Whether the United Nations likes it or not, with or without the United Nations, we will go to Iraq. That's bu the bully that America is. So they, they bullied their way. And the little Blair also following. <laughs> I, follow my, I follow my leader. I follow what America does. Yes, I'll be with you as ally, as an ally. So they went to Iraq. To hunted him, yes, he was in a hideout somewhere. Eventually got hold of him, and we saw him be, be, being taken away. They said he had been tried and found guilty. Guilty of what? of ill-treating his people, and he was hanged. Bush and his brother had a company sucking oil in Iraq. At the end of the day, they said, ah, oh, we made a mistake. He did not have weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> you see, damned imperialists. That's how they want to do it. Even Blair wanted to attack us. Your people have not told you that. They don't frighten you. He came here to government. I think Tom Baker was in charge. He said, no, give us the, the country so we can have our soldiers here. He said, no, others also said, no. That's why I included to attack Zimbabwe and remove Mugabe because we're taking land from uh, the settlers against his will. He wanted to stop the agreement that we had gone into with Margaret Thatcher, reverse it. It was Labour, you see, and Margaret Thatcher was conservative. So, for one reason, he... he did not appreciate the law of succession in international law, that you succeed to the debt, liabilities, and assets, you see, of your predecessor government. But no, what we want to do, we shall do. That's uh, Bush and Blair. And what is, who in the world can, can stop us? Well, our two governments, we are governments that come <coughs> out of, a, of bitter struggles. Just remember, remember, remember the suffering you had and, and under the apartheid regime. Yes, at the end when uh, Victory was now certain. They say they had abandoned the apartheid. It was not Christian. But you, you, all these years, you, you had not read your Bible well. <laughs> Look 
okay. As long as you will agree to be ruled by the majority, fine. So, you had a lot of mercy. Perhaps we say an overdose of uh, charity. In other circumstances, those others would have been, who, who were guilty of apartheid would have been tried. But uh, we also, having promised and pledged during the fight that uh, we will wipe them out. But also we had a touch of Christianity. <laughs> 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 and even uh, Ian Smith, we allowed him. And even allowed him to continue to sit in Parliament with his party. Well, the Constitution, the British had said, the Rhodesia Front, the whites will have their representatives alone. The Constitution stated that their constituencies will not be contested. The whites alone should be left to have 20% of uh, the of, of, of the House of Parliament. That is 20% out of, that is 20 out of 100. Blacks could not contest. It was uh, a racist provision. But uh, Nkomo and I said, uh, fine, since it had just a duration of seven years, we can we can allow it to, to 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 run for seven years, and after seven years we will amend it. So after seven years we said no, Ian Smith, that re the racial representation is is gone, and an amendment was done to the constitution. We abolished the tw twenty separate seats, but the whites could con contest. Uh, like anyone else. So there you are. This is what those before us did. But compare what we have done to them with what they did to us. But we said, fine, we are a charitable people, African people, are charitable apart from uh, the Christianity, and uh, let's live as peaceful people, all of us. Reconciliation, we had it. Here you had it even, uh, uh, I think, statutorily done. Uh, so, we have reconciliation, we want peace. We, we have said to ourselves, there was no need to fight anymore, because there is now peace. But this did not mean that there was no need to equip our people, to give them power, to give them the right of ownership over their resources. No, because that was the objective for which we fought. We didn't just fought for the vote. We fought, we fought for you to have the freedom to use the natural resources as your assets in business. Land, institutions of, of government should lend you money to start business. On uh, a non-racial basis and not discriminate, even standard, standard in, uh, standard bank in here, Barclays, I don't know, Barclays, I'd run away from here. Yeah. They come back, I'm sure. <laughs> but well, they, they, they went to Ian Smith, they were in Rhodesia, 
uh, we found standard and Bar and uh, and uh, and Barclays. They are still there. They are still the leading banks for that matter, because they have resource resources internationally. They can trade internationally. So these now should be the means available to you all in order for you to start your business. But the political environment is free. Government will regulate, obviously. They are certain fundamentals. If it's to be ownership, African ownership, black ownership, it must be truly so. The story of uh, groups visiting the president in his province of KwaZulu is also true of us. People come and say, ah, we have we, we put together our, our group. We, have, we want to, we have a claim, a coal claim we want to mine. And they are young blacks. Yes, they very look, they look very zealous and very determined. Have you got engineers? Yes, we have an engineer who, who worked for this, that, your Tinto or some other company. Mining engineer, yeah. And who is he? Sometimes just a white man. And when they say that they don't have money, of course. And then you discover, ah, they have whites behind there, just the front for the whites. Ah, that we don't want. If you're going to have a front for the whites, don't hide it. If they are to be partners alongside you, we find we, we will not say no to that, to part, proper partnership. We have uh, just now started mining our diamond. And government is supposed to, the, the first mines, those who started, we had not established our Indigenization Empowerment Act. It's 50-50. And government is supposed to be represented by individu individuals who are uh, really alert people. You say, yeah, you are uh, quite well educated, skilled, you represent our side. This is the Chinese side, they have 50. And what do you find? A practically in every case, our side just folds its hands. And all the management is done by the other side. But what is it? It is that kind of partnership we don't want. We would want to see if you're representing the government, that you truly are in the management, you truly are also aware of the processes of the mining system, right up to the time, if it's mining of diamonds, to the time when the diamonds then 
I selected and it's a very, very uh, intricate manner. Of you must be there. And you must be there when then the evaluation is done as to which diamonds are gem and which ones are industrial. But we are, uh, I'm afraid, not, not getting the services that really uh, please us. Then, of course, it's not just when we say we want to indigenize. The companies which exist now, phone companies, are not the only ones we want to address. We would want you to establish your own companies, completely African. We have had some approaches from here. Approaches, prominent people from South Africa. And we were, it's recommended even by, by members of government, by members of, by, by, by the ANC. We say, fine, come. What is your partnership? Who do you have? Uh, we have some Canadian from... Ah, what Canadian for? <laughs> <laughs> so, let's, let us, as we decide to have joint ventures, South Africans, Zimbabwe. have our own, entirely our own manpower, entirely our own banking resources, financial resources. If you put yourselves together and you're viable as a mining entity, you have skilled personnel. And what you lack is funding. Then we can help you borrow from resources that government can make available. That's different. That is what we would prefer. If you can borrow your own resources, do borrow your own resources. Anyway, we are starting perhaps, these are initial um, steps that will be improved upon in the future. But we are glad that our government yesterday signed a landmark agreement by which we reinforce the framework of cooperation between our two countries. And that by national commission which was created will ensure Perhaps that things are not only, agreements are not only put into practice, that is, fulfill, full, full, uh, their fulfillment will not be delayed, but will now be, time, be done timelessly. But as President Zuma said, even though we have this by 
National Commission. And we're giving it that weight I made reference to for 164 tons. It's 164 tons just to give you the weight. But you will be the doers. You will be the people, the partners, actually. And you will be the operators. We will ensure that there is definite operation taking place. Well, we have embarked upon a new path. It is a new path replete with countless opportunities to promote the economic development and improve the well-being of our respective countries and peoples. People oriented. And it remains people oriented projects and programs. To succeed, we must take full advantage of and exploit the many synergies that exist between our two economies, working closely together in sectors such as agriculture, manufacturing, the sector of energy, of services. If we do so, we can yield results. But we must have persons who are skilled, champions able to compete and make their mark beyond our national boundaries and even beyond our own region. Working together, we can make an impact beyond that which we can make when we act individually. I'm encouraged that we all recognize the value and advantage of working together, clearly evidenced by our presence here today. But we must go beyond the motions and the gestures. We must, through our actions, bring about the realization of the aspirations that first propelled us to this meeting. Be purposeful. At the end of this month, I look forward to receiving you in Harare together with our other colleagues in Sari at the extraordinary summit of our regional integration organization. Our deliberations on that occasion will concentrate on a single critical agenda, that of in this in, in industrialization. Industrialization through value addition and beneficiation, a beneficiation of our God-given natural resources, which our region is abundantly endowed with. It is my fervent hope that our summit meeting will agree on concrete projects that exploit our respective comparative advantages and that upon their implementation they will yield a real transformation of our economies for the benefit of all our people through improved opportunities for employment and empowerment. We can no longer remain exporters of primary commodities and expect to significantly and sustainably grow our economies. 
this is the stage where or most of us in Africa are, except South Africa, exporting raw materials. When I went to Ghana, 1958, Nkrumah was talking of their cocoa, and cocoa is produced not just by Ghana, it's also produced by Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, Nigeria. And Nkrumah was saying, if we come together, we can really establish a factory and produce the chocolates that Switzerland is producing using our cocoa. cocoa. But have, have they done it? I don't know whether they are chocolates yet produced. We still send cocoa. They, 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 they don't pronounce it as cocoa. They say cocoa. Cocoa. They still send cocoa to, uh, <laughs> to Switzerland. When, let me tell you how I, I got uh, surprised on one occasion. It was my first visit to Dubai. I've told this story to some of my ministers. I, uh, I looked around. The whole area is desert, desert, no, no, not a single see, tree growing. Then uh, my host says that we want to show you around the few factories. There is a, a British tea factory. Let's go to it. I say British tea factory. Is it like this way to do the British tea? So we went to the British tea factory. There was a young Briton there who was manager, and he was very happy to receive us with smiles and so on. Oh, yes, you have, you have come to, uh, to look at what we are doing. He said, yes, a tea factory. Uh, how do, where do you get your tea from? He looked at me and smiled and said, ah, Yes, we, we get our tea from Zimbabwe, <laughs> Malawi, uh, Kenya, and, and Tanzania. And they say, ah, and, and what do you do? We blend it. That is what we call El Grey. El Grey tea. English tea, and it's written English. <laughs> I say to my oh, goodness me, and he went on again to say, "Oh, those four blends, four four uh, teas we blend are not the only ones. Next year, we will import some from India and Sri Lanka to make them six and it will still be English tea. <laughs> Very English. <laughs> yeah, and the, the British write English tea. And in the hotels, actually, they ask you, do you want English tea or not? <laughs> there you are. Now, tea, couldn't we do the blending ourselves in, in our own region? You see, simple, simple, simple like that. But we, we, yes, we grow our tea and do our own packaging. But the, the blending, look at it, to give it the brand that is international. Kenya tried to do it, uh, pr produce their, their own brand of tea and coffee, and. We, we produce a bit of coffee. 
countries like Tanzania, Uganda produce much more. That would be a combination of these countries to produce a brand they can sell as East, East African uh, brand of tea, of, of coffee. The economic transformation that we seek is intended to benefit first and foremost our, our people. We expect and call upon our business people to embrace this trust, to appropriate it and actively partner us in its concretization. The economic transformation that we seek should also raise Africa's standing in a global economy and make more audible its voice in global policy forums. We are not saying Africa should do the impossible. We are saying we start with what we produce, albeit in a simple way. And our SMEs can be a starting point. Common President, trade is recognized as a powerful tool and vehicle for economic development and up, uplift, upliftment of people's lives. It is also recognized as an effective tool in promoting integration between countries and economies. These benefits of trade are not automatic. Conditions have to be created and nurtured to ensure that trade yields the desired results. Our two countries have over the years witnessed a steady exponential growth in the trade exchanges between us. And indeed, we know we are the leading trading partner of South Africa in Africa, in the whole Africa. We are the first trading partners in terms of volumes of South Africa. And uh, Commonwealth President made reference to that and made reference also to a situation which, uh, which has been caused by sanctions on us. Whilst South Africa's trade volume of exports to us has been rising, our exports to South Africa have had a downward trend. And the issue now is, the, is how we remedy that gap. In my view, it's not a gap that should be remedied by saying, ah, uh, let's have better figures for Zimbabwe. That talk of improved exports. But you have to have the exports first. And the statistics are mere, a mere expression of your performance. And this is it. And there, naturally, we, is also an expectation of uh, uh, South Africa easing <coughs> The, the trading that uh, the trading system, so we can export to South Africa a little more, greater volumes. Ro Ms., uh, uh, Minister Rock Davis, there, there is uh, the cry <laughs> from our. Uh, <laughs> exporters and would-be exporters, that they are certain, certain uh, measures that, are, that South Africa 
uh, is taking or postures that he takes that may make it impossible for us to increase volumes of of exports. Our two countries are agreed that the, the, this imbalance is neither sustainable nor desirable. If we are agreed on it, well, let's, look, let's study ways and means of, of uh, uh, improving the system. It is in our mutual interest to restore a relationship of equal partners in our bilateral trade. The, mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, I can give an example. We, we, we are a leading grower of tobacco and we compete with Brazil which uh, uh, normally is number two to, to, to the United States as grower of tobacco. And uh, when this, the season is not that good in Brazil, and we are that good, so we become number two. But this is not to say uh, we are the only growers of tobacco. China is probably the first grower, but also the most massive smoker of, of their own tobacco, plus the to our own too. They smoke a lot. <laughs> so, well, they smoke a lot. We provide for their appetite to smoke. <laughs> Whatever our doctors say, and I have a doctor uh, in, in my team, and he listens to the, uh, the voice of WHO, which says smoking must be discouraged. Smoking must be discouraged. Not growing must be discouraged. <laughs> if he was to come to me and say, ah, we have been to a WHO meeting, they now say growers of tobacco must be sanctioned, I would say, ha, ah, ha, and what did you say? No, of course. I have always said our people grow tobacco. They don't smoke as much as the Chinese. And anyway, you can't say don't grow and don't sell tobacco because it is responsible for deaths, the deaths of people. Nicotine then gets to the lungs and so on. And I say, no, compare smoking with whiskey drinking. We have more accidents because people are drunk on the road. Shall we say the Scottish must must stop producing their whiskey and brandies and so on? Let's hear someone suggest that uh, stop producing whiskey, brandy, and so on, and uh, let people drink Coca Cola. <laughs> No, you say, well, these are the dangers. If you take the, too much whiskey, too much drink, of alcohol, the danger to your cell, to your lungs. If you smoke too much of cigarettes, the danger to your lungs. So people must judge. 
be able to use their own judgment as to the measures which they should take in order to remain safe. But all the same, we, we, see, we say, tell people that smoking is hazardous. The point I was making is that we are now manufacturing cigarettes. And South Africa, whilst it says other exports can come by car, by rail, it says these ones should come by air. And, and we say, why? You see? And uh, we, 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 we realize it's to try and prevent. <laughs> so it's to make them more expensive if you fly cigarettes, cigarettes and it. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah it, it's not cigarettes, yeah, ma'am. Cigarettes are just barred. They bar them uh, by whether they come by land or by air. Uh, but uh, but uh, it's, uh, the ph pharmaceutical, uh, the drugs we produce, they are healthy drugs. And uh, the, they say these must come by, by, by air rather than uh, on land. And we don't understand. I think it's, it's to, to try and reduce competition with the South Africa's one. Well, competition is healthy. I don't see it. We don't produce volumes, really. And it would help also minimize the, uh, the need for people to be coming to South Africa and, you know, uh, lining here in South Africa and uh, causing uh, an, 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 an unnecessary, sometimes, accidents or incidents to happen because so many people are coming for medicine, for treatment to South Africa when we get the drugs back home and they are approved and they are, our people fortunately, the uh, pharmaceutical, the health people interact and they, they, they approve or disapprove certain drugs. So these matters are here for discussion. I'm pleased to note that our, our business people have concentrated their minds on exploring cooperation and investment opportunities in various sectors in our two countries. And this matter is one such that must, these two countries must examine. Zimbabwe, like many other countries, needs foreign investment. And uh, we, we used to get assistance, for example, in uh, giving to certain, certain, by the banks, to certain growers of this or growers of that, or manufacturers of this or manufacturers of that commodity. But uh, these credits are no longer uh, available in the same abundant manner in which they used to be. Now, the more we, are, we produce, the better capacity we have to import. There is no way we can say I will never import from South Africa. No, South Africa is a larger country, much larger than Zimbabwe, with a larger economy, larger base than economy, and its volumes exceed those of Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe can grow its capacity, earning capacity, whether from uh, employer employment or from... Uh, its, its, its own enterprises, direct, but 
the more incomes we have, the more earnings we have, the greater the capacity also to import and import even technology. In, and these are capital now, capi capital goods. When you import, say, tractors, you are importing capital goods. But when you uh, import uh, juices and so on, these are consumers. You consume them and that's it. But uh, tractors help us to grow more. So people can have higher earnings, more earnings, and grow their capacity also to do business. I say Zimbabwe, like many other countries, needs foreign investment, in our case particularly, so given, particularly so given the damage done to our economy because of, uh, of, of sanctions, we would ask South Africa to look at that aspect of assisting us to some measure. We know you have your own limits also, but uh, you still have the capacity to assist. We welcome and encourage foreign investment into our country. Contrary to some uh, media reports, the security of investments, both foreign and domestic, is guaranteed at law and in practice. We, we have never nationalized people's assets, people's businesses. No. The land we took, we, and even there, although we had the right to take it without negotiating, we still negotiated with the British. We have not nationalized a single item. The British have about, have about 400 companies in our country. In spite of the fact that they imposed sanctions on us, we didn't retaliate by saying these companies will not operate. No. We are, as a government, intensely working towards improving the investment climate in order to achieve increased inflows of foreign direct investment into the country. Institutionally, the one-stop shop investment center at the Zimbabwe Investment Authority, which will drastically reduce the waiting time for the approval of investment proposals, should be operational in a matter of months. Work is already underway to improve the case of going the ease of, of going business in Zimbabwe, or going to business in Zimbabwe, or doing business in Zimbabwe. So um, our ministers, economic ministers are saying, come, we do business. Come, we can be joint, joint partners. Comrades, comrade president, ladies and gentlemen, I'm informed that among those present in this meeting are some of my compatriots who are resident here in South Africa. Their presence is, is yet evidence of the many ties that bind our two countries and peoples. My compatriots being an asset to our two countries we intend to share their skills and capacities equitably. We are glad, we hope they are not disgracing us, that they, <laughs> they are doing business as it should be done, honestly, with integrity. It is with this in mind that the government of Zimbabwe is in the process of developing 
a national diaspora policy which should be in place before the end of the year. The national diaspora policy intends, among other objectives, to create opportunities for the Zimbabwean in diaspora to contribute through their investment as they work in, uh, in South Africa and elsewhere to contribute their investment, their skills, their expertise or other capacities towards the development agenda in the country. They can be also organizing a business, they can be building homes for parents, for themselves, that is welcome development. They can be participating in businesses. The development agenda is anchored, of course, also on Zimasset. Since 1980, we have sought to empower those of our country's citizens who were previously disadvantaged and discriminated against. These are the people you are referring to uh, in your own country as uh, having been the underdogs. Immediately upon the attainment of independence, government focused on ensuring access by all to essential services such as education and health. The results achieved have been evident. For example, in the well-recognized high literacy levels in the country. Zimasit is an empowerment agenda focused on creating opportunities for the meaningful participation in and contribu contribution to the national economy by the previously disadvantaged of our citizens. Common President, ladies and gentlemen, finally I want to thank you for bringing us together today in this forum. I wish to conclude by assuring all of you that Zimbabwe is open for business. <laughs> Zimbabwe is a genuine, sincere and serious partner to all those who are similarly disposed. And so we look forward to partnering you in our economic development agenda. I'm not suggesting that you come for employment. I'm suggesting that you come for better things as, em as employers yourselves, as doers of business together with us. And come well equipped you can come in mining, in fact, on joint ventures. You do mining here. We do mining in Zimbabwe. So it can be 50-50. We are partners. We form a company on 50-50. Uh, we, mine, we mine in Zimbabwe and we mine in, in South Africa. We carry out uh, an ag agricultural projects that you think can add to your own capacity. Perhaps you are manufacturing certain things out of cotton. You, we grow cotton together. And here we can see what our joint venture can do in the cotton industry uh, manufacturing. So there it is. And I would want to finally to say, well, we are not just appealing to men, we are appealing also to the ladies. <laughs> and I know the ladies have lots of things they, uh, they would want to come and, and, and sell. Sure. Selling, 
but of course we are very I was going to say uh, famous for that but sometimes notorious for <laughs> for it yeah, our ladies are everywhere but I'm talking <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm talking not of those ones those, <laughs> those ones are really supporters of families you see they, they need at the end they are more careful than the men. When in the years of drought, like this year, it is the ladies that use their hands, where their husbands use their mouth. <laughs> so, uh, We men are not like women. <laughs> they are very, very vigilant about the family situation. And we are not, we, South Africa and our, ourselves, are not like others to the north. We are particular about certain things. The child must have a uniform, for example, to go to school. Others have dispensed with, with the, with the need for uniform. They say it's too expensive for families. But our fa the rural mother, rural mother will do anything. I have her own chickens, her own goats, sell them. My child, my daughter must have her uniform. She must have her books. She must have uh, uh, everything that the teachers say she should have. They strain themselves to that extent. Yeah, but skilled ladies, joint ventures, even lawyers, after all, it's, it's, it's the same law, really, Roman Dutch. You can have a partners joint, or a firm here can establish a branch in, in, in Zimbabwe and practice also there. So there it is. And I hope our people who have come here We have done their own exercise and established that there is really that great wealth of friendship and alliance. And uh, as I say, let us be open. Tell the true story of Zimbabwe, our Zimbabwean people. And I, I think all sectors except agriculture are represented here. Uh, but the, those who are here can, can speak about, you know, agro-industrial in, um, enterprises that can, that can be established back home. I want to thank you and thank you for listening and I want to assure you that uh, South Africa and ourselves are really inseparable allies, inseparable siblings, and we should ensure on the basis of this alliance, on the basis of this family togetherness, that our people our people for whom we went to prison, for whom we suffered so much, <coughs> sacrificed so much, are beneficiaries of independence. It's sad to see our people still in the same condition as they, they were before the political dispensations of, of both countries. Let us, let us please, we business people, with government assistance where necessary, ensure that 
there is transformation in the lives of people. They, that they have better homes. There is land, land, open land for them to ameliorate the situation in Soweto, for example, in Chitungwiza back home. They can build better houses, cater for their families, and not have a situation in which their children are born into poverty and therefore born into crime with thee, as they suffer, as they hunger, they say, ah, we cannot continue this way when others have, we, are, we don't have. So from those we have, we shall take. And taking is not legal, to taking that which is not yours, that's what they call robbery or theft, and so they end up thieving. I want Comrade President to thank you for the opportunity we have had to present ourselves, and for the joy we have had to be your guests and to be, you know, treated in, in a loving way that uh, uh, has made us feel so, feel, uh, so comfortable, feel so much at home that uh, I'm sure if the visit had been longer, we would not have minded. <laughs> But of course, we say South Africa is our, our second home, and we, we come here quite often as individuals. We come here, as I say, also sometimes when we, have, we are in trouble and uh, we, see, we seek medical treatment. Uh, we come here for holiday also, and of course there are those who have come here who are in employment, and we are together. We shall always be together. We were in the same trenches, and I end up by saying, Amanda, Amanda.